Welcome everyone. My name is Jen Hicks. I'm the Director of Communications and Outreach for Maine Woodland Owners. Tonight's program is called our Forest, Forest Carbon Offsets for Small Woodland Owners. This will be a, a presentation led by our Executive Director, Tom D Doak. Um, he has uh, been very, um, he's been swimming in this information for about a year and a half. Uh, maybe even a little bit more about how forests play a role in um, offsetting carbon emissions uh, in our atmosphere and what role forest, or forest owners um, can play, especially the small woodland owners, where it's become a little clearer on how the larger owners can play a role, but it's been less clear about the role small woodland owners play. So tonight's uh, presentation is going to address that. Um, this is a uh, relatively interactive program, uh, meaning that uh, Tom's happy to have people ask questions as the program continues, if you need clarification or if you need uh, just a little bit more information. Um, there's a few ways that you can do that tonight. Um, one is to enter your question in the chat. I will be monitoring that throughout the night. And then the other will be if you mouse below your video screen and, to be, and so you can view the icons, you'll see one of the icons is called reactions. You click on that, and then you click on raise hand. If you do that, I'll know, I'll know that you wanna ask a question and I'll call on you. Um, it's very helpful that everybody has their name um, listed, uh, which it looks like everybody does. So we, we, we should be all set. But if you want to have your first name uh, called out, that would, be, that would be helpful for me uh, on your ID. Um, and then another thing, I've, a last minute uh, development for this event is that it is, this event does um, qualify for Forrester credits. Um, and Tom can explain a little bit more, uh, but this is uh, the Society of American Foresters have, uh, has qualified this as a uh, eligible for one and a half credits for continuing educations for, for Foresters. So if that's something you would like, Make sure your name is complete in your identification um, uh, because I will record the, um, the registry of who's attended tonight and then I can use that for anybody who wants to receive those credits. So if you do need those credits, please complete have a complete name on your participant name uh, in this program tonight. I think those are all the things that you need to know before I um, hand it over to Tom. Again, Tom Doak has been our executive director since uh, 2004. He is a licensed forester himself. He was the director of the Forest Service, main forest service uh, in the early 2000s, uh, late 1990s and early 2000s. And he has led this organization uh, to, uh, to a growth, um, uh, to the size of this organization that it is now. It's, it's seen an incredible growth and we're very um, lucky to have him here tonight talking about yet another growth area, uh, carbon uh, offsets. And uh, is, it, is it right for you? He's gonna help you um, provide, he'll provide that information and help you maybe answer that question for yourself um, by the end of this program. Tom, uh, you're on. Great, thanks so much, Jen. And uh, I'll add a third way you can uh, ask a question. If, if the other two methods fail, Turn your video screen on and wave, and eventually one Jen or one of us will see you and recognize you, and you um, you can ask, ask your question. Um, so I'm I'm going to talk briefly uh, at the beginning here about just a few basic things about carbon, and um, so that we're all kind of on the same page, and then talk about the different markets and different uh, way carbon markets are structured. And then I'm going to finish up with the discussion of two of the two of the systems that probably um, have the biggest potential, at least right now, to be to be helpful or of interest to to smaller landowners. So that's the what I'll do. I'll take questions uh, throughout. Um, hopefully, we can make it work well on Zoom here. So. Um, and this is my first time sharing a screen on a presentation, so hopefully I'm, hopefully I'm as skilled as Richard is at doing this. Uh, well, maybe not. Uh, Jen, I don't seem to be able to. Oh, there we go. So uh, I want to start basically with um, 
the the governor's um, the so the governor had announced a couple of years ago uh, carbon reduction goals for Maine, and forests are going are a major part of this. So I just wanted to go over those real quickly with you. Um, um, so there are actually two goals. One of them is to reduce green the actual emission levels um, from the basic from the emission levels of 1990. And you can see on, on the left hand side, it's 45% reduction from 1990 to 2030, and then an 80% reduction, total reduction from 1990 to 2050. So that's the emission side, reducing the amount that actually is going into the atmosphere. At the same time, the companion goal is, is to be carbon neutral, meaning that whatever does go into the air is offset by some other something else. And that's what carbon neutrality is. And the goal there is by 2045 that we will have offset in the state of Maine, any emissions, all emissions, um, all emissions um, that, that we, I don't know why my phone's ringing. So, um, so I thought it'd be kind of interesting to talk about what the, what the sources of greenhouse gases are in Maine and each state is a little different. I think when people think of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, they probably think of um, you know industry and, and things like that, you know, that uh, heavy industries or something. And they have that, uh, many people have that, that sense. But here's the actual chart of what the emissions are in the state of Maine. By far the biggest source of emissions in the state of Maine is in the transportation sector. That means people getting from here to there. Uh, in in motorized vehicles of some kind, or in, and it's more than fifty percent of all emissions in Maine. The second big, the second biggest one is residential. You know, your your use in your home, heating or electricity, and those kind of things. So those two, you know, make up as you see, can see a very very substantial amount. So. There's a lot of work going on, and I was on the governor's task force on the on 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 the carbon offsets. But I've been listening in, as some of you have, on some of the other discussions. And there's a lot of effort going on on the transportation and residential side, and, and rightly so, because if you're going to reduce emissions, then um, you have to deal with particularly with those two big areas. And you can see the other kind of three general categories. Commercial, uh, those would be like stores and you know um, the, uh, things like that, and then in industrial are mills and and uh, then you can see even uh, power generation is about seven percent. But so there's a lot of discussion going on about um, the value of reducing emissions versus offset, and um, the idea is it's really the goal long term is to reduce emissions as far as you can instead of just offsetting them just stop putting the stuff into the air so there's a lot of work here but in the meantime to get um as emissions are coming down um the idea is how do we offset those while people continue to work at reducing emissions and that's where forests are going to come in and continue and will come in and play a major role here and where landowners will come in and be involved <clears throat> So what do the forests have to do with it? So I wanna talk about carbon storage and carbon sequestration, because they are different. And people talk about them as if they're sometimes the same, but they're, but they're not. Um, you know, sequestration is the rate at which carbon is picked up in the forest. And a young forest actually is where the highest sequestration rate occurs. The highest rate of carbon take up in a forest is in a younger forest in a 20 to 25, it generally peak in about 20, 25 years. So young forests are an important component because they're taking that carbon out of the atmosphere. The storage, however, when you get a, a more a, a older forest, you're gonna be storing, storing more carbon. So it's important to both have, think about the rate of sequestration and carbon being sequestered, but also once it's sequestered, have, keeping it stored in a way that doesn't just release it back into the atmosphere. So there are two, two parts of this. And about, if you look at the right-hand side, you'll see that about half the weight of wood 
um, in, in a tree is, is, uh, is carbon. So it's a big part of a tree. So remember the, that, that the concept of you know, sequestration and storage. I mean, there's discussion about why don't we just stop cutting trees and we will solve, you know, we will suck up all this carbon. Well, what it shows you is if you stop cutting trees, you may store a bunch at some point. Remember the, of course, trees die and when they die, they, the carbon goes back into the atmosphere, but you're not, you're not necessarily absorbing a lot as much as you could. So, um, there is kind of this growing movement of that we're going to we're going to solve all the climate issues if we just never cut any trees. That isn't the case, and also people need wood products from from the forest, and some of the products from forest are, are better for the climate, frankly, than some of the other carbon-based products. So it's important the forests are a major player here, but you know, management of the uh, appropriate manage of the forest is going to be. It, can play a huge role and does play a huge role in Maine. And I'm assuming if you see a question, you're gonna pop, you're gonna let me know. Otherwise I'm gonna keep going. That's correct. So just to, you know, just to make sure, you know, we think of the forest, but we also need to think about the products that come from the forest and, you know, under, understand that there's a lot of carbon stored in, in, in wood that is used in buildings and building materials and, um, all kinds of things. So not only is it imp look important to look at what's actually in the forest, but what can we do with carbon with, with forest products that ends up restoring more carbon? Because if you've got a wooden desk, it's storing carbon. If your house wouldn't built house, it's got a lot of carbon stored in it and stored for a potentially a very long time. So part of the equation is how do you how do you use more wood products that have a shelf life and you know how can we uh, how can we do that and actually you know store it and keep that carbon stored and you can see you know there's a lot of discussion about um, new building pro pro uh, products um, in this country we don't build very many tall bu big buildings or tall buildings out of wood but if you look at the year in, in Europe you'll see uh, and and some and some other states, you'll see much taller. You'll see multi-story um, buildings made from wood, and uh, there's a heck of a lot of carbon stored in those um, uh, buildings. One of the problems, one of the problems in building with wood has been um, fire codes, and you know, I think we tend to have fire codes based upon. You know the the concern that a, a wooden building is going to burn and people will die, and then like they you know like tenement buildings and so many of the fire codes came about because people because it was unsafe when a fire got going going in wooden buildings that were all connected. So we still have fire code issues about uh, how to how to you know get around you know not get around them but uh, modernize the fire codes that take into account how you know how wooden buildings are. Uh, constructed and frankly, there's a there is a squabble going on between the building the different uh, the different interests that represent different building um, products, um, steel, concrete, wood. They're they're in competition, and you you can read about um, you know uh, the steel industry talking about how wood isn't good and it's not safe, and you can read about the wood people saying, well, it's better than steel, and so there's some squabbling going on there, but. There is a huge opportunity, I guess, to as I'm just saying, to build, to to use wood in a whole variety of ways that perhaps we're not and uh, using it right now and and storing, cut more carbon, and that's one of the things also, kind of being worked on. So where are we right now? Uh, we are kind of in in, in an every an ideal position. Um, so the forest right now. Uh, on an annual uh, on an annual basis, stores about sixty percent of the um, emissions. Uh, takes up about sixty percent. So, question about sixty percent of all emissions is given the forest that we have. When you start talking about durable wood, uh, wood products, it puts us at about seventy five percent toward carbon neutrality. And that's simply the forest. It's interesting. The forest is the only 
it's the only industry that is carbon. If you think about it, the only industry that's carbon neutral, I think, is is the forest industry. It offsets the forest and the industry offsets uh, is a positive. All other industries are actually not. Um, even agriculture is not. So the forests are playing an enormous part. And the only, frankly, the only way we will get to carbon neutrality in this state, frankly, is is through either dramatic, dramatic reductions in emissions or keeping the forest there. Um, there's a lot of discussion going on in the Northeast about, it's interesting that a number of the other states that don't have the percent of forest that we have are looking at trying to be carbon neutral and say, how do we get some carbon from Maine? You know, How do we get credit for some carbon in Maine? And so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we're in an interesting position here in the state um, and the forests are playing a major role. And the interesting thing is uh, much of the management for at least on the small landowner side that's gone on, it's not, people don't really have it until the last few years talked about managing for carbon, but their management has resulted in significant carbon being sequestered and actually, and stored. And so we just haven't called it that. But now when people start looking at it, it's done pretty darn well. And, uh, and there's a potential certainly to, to do more um, with the forest. So what trees have the most carbon? Basically a hardwood tree generally contains more carbon than soft and think of it as weight. You know, a heavier piece of wood has got more carbon in it. Um, that's just kind of the, the simple way to do it. A little kind of side note, um, remember that any forest product that starts to break down also has carbon in it and, emit, and, it, and is emitted back. And I, actually hardwood leaves break down quicker so when you have softwood needles, they tend to hang around. They have a little more shelf life, so they don't break down as, uh, quite as quickly. And so they actually is storing, at least in transitionally, a little bit more carbon over, over a period of time than, than uh, hardwood leaves. But um, generally, uh, hardwood trees have, have more carbon than softwood. OK. so. Carbon in the forest, let's talk about, you know, things to th think about as a landowner. Uh, and we, we had a lot of conversations on the carbon task force about, about this issue. You know, the first thing is if you can keep the land forested, in Maine, if you can keep it forested, it's going to grow trees, it's going to sequester carbon. You know, that's how do we, how do we help people that want to keep their land as forested land, keep it as forested land? That's kind of job one, frankly. The second thing is is a healthy forest. You know, diseased and dying trees emit carbon. You know, whether you're you don't have to cut them to have them emit. I mean, they're they're going to die. And frankly, um, uh, you know, there's substantial issues around health and and disease, specifically you know later to climate. There's some new problems emerging in the forest that we haven't seen before that are gonna either limit growth, potentially limit growth or cause uh, uh, damage or mortality in ways that we've not seen. So keeping it forced uh, healthy and trying to manage, potentially even managing it in a way that promotes healthiness and perhaps in a different way than we've thought about in the past. Another one, if you can grow high quality products, I, I can tell you that for years I've said to people, you know, you can always gonna sell a high quality tree, no matter what, it always is gonna have value. Uh, and the species is, you know, a high quality of any tree species is going to have value uh, from a landowner point of view, but it also is much more likely to be made into a product that's gonna have last. You know, uh, paper stores it for a while, but paper has a pretty short, short uh, life. But if you can produce a high quality tree that goes into a solid wood product, now that carbon is gonna be stored for a very long time. Um, if we can increase growth rates, we will increase the amount of carbon, both uh, at least sequestered and, uh, and potentially stored. The potential of the forest in Maine to grow more wood than it's growing and, a, and, a, and at a higher rate is there, but there are, you know, it's partly about it's partly about management and making good choices, but the ability to increase the amount of growth in the forest 
is there. Biologically, it's very possible. It just takes some work and some effort. And diversifying tree species and the forest. You know, one of the challenges with climate, you know, we're talking about carbon, but we're really talking also about climate. And you could some of the issues that we're seeing um, that are kind of new, you've seen the uh, the needle, needle drop on pines for the last several years. There are other issues around pine um, that, that, are, that are related to moisture issues. And so can you, can you manage that forest and can you, can you get some more airflow? Can you get those stands of pine so that you don't trap as much moisture and create more of some of the problems or you know, a diverse, no matter what happens in the climate, if you've got diversity, you know, something will benefit, but something will something will something will be uh, disadvantaged, some tree species will, or some situations or locations will. But if you've got a diversity, then it's not all your eggs in one basket. And that's an important concept. And then it's not often thought of, but there's an enormous amount of carbon in forest soils. And that, you know, how, how do we keep these undisturbed or, or reduce the disturbance levels in the carbon in the soils in forests and the, you know, when, when operation, the harvesting is going on, how do we limit those activities to the point where you're not getting substantial disturbance of the site so that carbon is not being disturbed and sits there in the, in the soil. Um, there's an, as I say, an enormous amount of carbon in the forest, in the forest soils. Um, a lot more than in an agricultural setting because it's sitting there undisturbed and actually, you know, uh, you can even add soil. You can actually you can actually accumulate additional carbon in forest soils. So those are all things to think about. Um, and that's kind of my primer. Those are all the forest, you know, the primer things that I wanted to talk about. Do you want to see if anybody has questions? Yeah, because I'm gonna I'm gonna start yeah. talking about markets now. So any questions about you know any of this anything I've said off the bat. Just go ahead and unmute if you want um, to jump in. I must be really clear. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to. Oh, there's one person. I'm sorry. Uh, Jean, did you want to jump in? Okay. I just saw her unmute. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So now I'm going to turn to carbon markets and how they operate and. Um, I'm gonna talk about two different types of markets, the regulatory market and the voluntary market. I'm gonna spend most of my time is gonna be in the voluntary market because that's really where the action is gonna be for smaller owners. But I wanna make you aware of the regulatory markets that are there um, because they're the ones that have that kind of started this thing. And then the voluntary markets are, uh, have, are, are diversifying and there are a lot of options being developed on the voluntary side. But quickly on the regulatory market, it, it basically a regulatory market is where a, a emitter of carbon must is required by law to offset emissions. So there's not a choice here. They are required as part of their operation. It could be a um, coal plant. It could be you know any, anything that is Something that has a regula regulated emissions has to do have to have an offset for those that for if it can't reduce its emissions. So it's largely developed and based in California. There is a there are, at least in the on in you know, the United States there is a market in um, has been a market in parts of Canada uh, for this. It the value um, it's a very high value per carbon is the. Uh, and just to keep that in mind, the people that have played in that market and have been in the offset market in the regulatory market get a, a pretty hefty return. It's very complex standards, very expensive to comply. Generally, you're making a commitment. If you're a woodland owner, you're making a commitment for 100 years to meet the standards that are required in the regulatory market. A 100 year commitment, which is enormous. Um, frankly, if we haven't got it figured out before 100 years, then my personal view is carbon is not going to, we're not going to be talking about carbon sequestration 100 years from now. Um, but 
anyway, it's a hundred year commitment. And you basically got to have a very large uh, ownership uh, in, in you know, thousands of acres to, to cover the cost of, um, of, of complying with a very uh, complex and expensive regulatory market. So it's available to those that own you know, several hundred thousand acres and things like that, uh, or, but not, not the smaller owner. So I'm not gonna spend a lot more time on that, um, but just so you ought to know that those are there and some of the things you may have read about or heard about are on the, on the regulatory side. The voluntary market operates differently. The voluntary market um, says these are not companies or these can be individuals, but companies or businesses that are not, not legally required to offset emissions, but have decided for, for whatever reasons, and many of them um, kind of uh, the, you know, the right to continue or um, uh, it's just a good business practice that um, they want to offset their emissions or partly offset their emissions. And so they're not required, but they decide they, they want to. And they operate in kind of two different ways. And I'm gonna, when we get to talk about the, uh, um, two different approaches to this, we'll, we'll talk more, but traditionally the voluntary markets have developed um, where you have, um, you, go, you go out and take, uh, the forester goes out, measures plots, establishes permanent inventory plots, and those get remeasured on a periodic basis to determine what, how much carbon is there and are you, are you continuing to maintain the carbon you have and, um, or the carbon you agreed to when you sold the credit. And then um, the other part of it is, um, the other approach that's being worked on is instead of permanent plots, uh, a harvest deferral. You had planned to harvest, but you're going to say, no, nah, I'm not going to harvest. And I kind of paid not paid to not harvest or paid to delay or harvest. Um, or undertake some kind of practice that is carbon friendly that might that would increase growth beyond where you would typically planning to do. And so that's kind of how the voluntary markets operate. But I'm going to talk about more detail here. So traditional, the, the traditional voluntary markets, basically you don't sell your, if, if a company wants to buy, so we're, we're, I'm gonna talk about the voluntary markets now from pretty much from now on. So if you don't, if you don't, you don't uh, a company doesn't call you up and say, you're a woodland owner, I wanna sell, uh, I wanna buy your carbon credits. Um, there are carbon registries and these are two of the ones, there, there are others, but American Carbon Registry and the Verified Carbon Standard, um, registry. Those are two uh, registries that have their own standards for what would count as a credit, uh, a carbon credit. And there are companies that work with people that own land to qualify them under the, one of the, under the protocols of one of these registries to, to kind of list their credits and qualify them as credits that can be then be put into the marketplace and a company can buy it through the registry um, by carbon by carbon credits. It's normally done through a bidding. It can be a bidding process. You you, but there's kind of a middle person that the landowner isn't the one registering their credits, uh, particularly in the, on, on the volunteer market. You're working with a third party to vault to get you into the qualify you for the carbon register. And these are people companies that understand the registry and also have contacts, frankly, with businesses that want to buy your credits. So they can help you sell your credits. Now they take a piece of the action for doing that. Um, so your, the, what your carbon gets sold at is a percentage that goes to one of the folks that helps you register your carbon credits. But it, you don't sell directly to a company in general unless you are a, a, a major player. So here's the basics of how they work. So generally, the amount of carbon is determined in permanent inventory plus, as I mentioned. And now the, the systems are, can be a little different, but these are generally 
the ones, these are generally apply to any of the registries. You commit to at least as much uh, maintaining at least as much carbon as you, as when you started with. And in, remember I mentioned the permit, the uh, regulatory market is 100, generally 100 years. The voluntary market generally is about 40 year commitment. So you're making a, a 40 year commitment instead of a 100 year commitment. Harvesting is allowed, timber harvesting is allowed, generally as long as you maintain the levels that you started with. And that means harvesting no more than grows from the period of time when you signed up for the next 40 years. Every five years, there's a partial re-inventory of your land. Every 10 years, a full inventory. So this, there's a, a, a short version inventory and then a full remeasure of any, of any of the plots every 10 years. You don't have the upfront cost. The people that register, the company that helps you register your carbon takes a percentage of it and sets everything up generally for the first five or 10 years. So they get you into the registry. They've done, they paid for the inventory up front, the inventory, the permanent plots establishment, and at least the first partial re-inventory. And some, some of them do uh, the first full re-inventory as part of their, their cut. Um, and they get paid off in the first, uh, they get paid off in the first five to 10 years. So they get a piece of the action and you get all, almost all of your funds come in the first two or three years. So you're paid generally up front. You've got a 40 year commitment, but most of you, almost all your revenue comes in the first two to two to three or four years. After that, you still have the cost of maintaining, you need to maintain the carbon that you've said you will, and you're responsible for the cost of the inventories after the first, after the first 10 year cycle, but up to, to the year 40. So you're responsible for all subsequent costs. You can contract with the same entity that got you credit and that got you qualified for the registry, or you can use a forester that is, rec that is recognized in a system that's recognized by the registry to, to re-inventory. But you, you do have those costs and they will, they estimate the people that help you register yours also will say of your proceeds, you need to set aside a certain amount of money for, for your future obligations. There is a, um, you don't get paid for all the carbon you have on your, on your land when you have a carbon, when you register your carbon. There's a, there's a percentage that's held back for set aside for natural disasters. It's the idea that what happens if you're, you know, if you have an insect outbreak or a, some uh, a hurricane or things like that. So you're not paid for 100% of it. There's a percentage. There's a percentage held back. So the voluntary markets um, have traditionally had a minimum of five thousand. Uh, the the traditional voluntary market, where you go to the registry, register your credits, has traditionally been about a minimum of about five thousand acres. That number is coming down and continues to come down. Um, the the real success, I think, will be to getting to smaller. Will be when when um, the registries uh, accept and uh, the inventory is perfected using satellites. It's very expensive to send somebody out on the ground, remeasuring a bunch of inventory plots and inventorying, uh, measuring trees on a five and 10 year cycle. If you can do it with uh, satellite imagery and the technology that exists, that reduces the cost dramatically and that reduces the amount of uh, uh, the, the size of a property that you need. And, there, and these, this approach also allows multiple landowners to get together. So if you needed 5,000 acres, you could put you know, multiple landowners together, create a, create a 5,000 acre uh, package, and then go to the registry that way. Um, so those are all kind of possibilities. And I say 5,000 now, but the number will go down and continue to go down, frankly, on this. What's uh? What do you get? What do you get back? I mean, people. How much is it worth? One of the really interesting things about the voluntary market is when you're when you're dealing with these uh, middle folks, there are they, the whole carbon world 
is not yet unmasked about pricing and things like that. I mean, you have to, it's all, conf, it's kept as confidential information. In fact, if you're going to register your credits uh, through, uh, through a company onto the registry, they're going to make you sign something that says you can't disclose um, dollar amounts, procedures, and things like that, process how you, without, without permission of them. So it's, we're still at this point where everybody wants to keep things a secret. Um, but generally, you would be paid upfront, generally now, I wanted to put a number in here, three to $400 per acre is what you would receive if you put your land into the carbon registry. That's what you get up front. Now you have to factor in that any cost that you have over that 40, 40 year period of time. So you're getting the money up front, um, knowing that you can also manage your land and generate revenue from the land, but you've got to keep as much carbon in place as when you started. So you're, you're limited by the amount of that you can harvest. So you need to plan for the 40 year expenses. You get most of your money up front. Um, and, and the revenue really does come to you early. And it, so you need to plan, if you're going into one of these programs, you need to plan and set aside some funds because you have this legal obligation to, um, to cover all the costs, particularly, the, it's really the inventory costs that you need to cover. So now I wanna talk about, so, for, so those are still out of reach for, Many landowners, although I think the numbers are going to come down, and I think we'll be in a, you know, you'll be in a, it'll be in a different position here uh, before too before too long, but it's still still high. So there are two. I'm going to talk about two different, two other kind of non-traditional voluntary uh, possibilities for landowners, and these probably apply, these will apply more to individual smaller owners than in anything I've talked about. So I started with the regulatory market, which is very large, the traditional voluntary market, which is in the 5,000 acre plus or minus range, but coming down. And now, and there's a recognition that, well, that still doesn't allow a lot of people to participate. So this is another variation of voluntary carbon markets. I think I think I want, I just want to reiterate right now that the world is, the, these things are changing very rapidly. And so what I'm going to tell you now may be different than the two programs I want to talk about are both going to, they're both going to appear at our annual meeting on January 11th at the Augusta Civic Center. And they may have additional information that I don't even have because those systems are evolving. But let me talk about two different approaches that are being developed. And there are others that I'm not going to talk about, but these are the two that seem to have the most um, appeal at this point. Hey, Tom, I just want to yeah. jump in. We do have a question about how this revenue affects income tax. Is that something you'll you'll touch base with later in the? Program? Yeah, I, I, I pretty sure it's going to be a um, a pretty sure it's uh, ordinary income. Unfortunately, and one of the things we are looking at is how do we you know how do you how do you deal with that? Uh, so the the um. In, in, uh, income from timber harvesting is a long-term capital on, on federal income tax is a long-term capital gain if it's traditional forest products. But as, as far as I know, carbon is going. Carbon is ordinary income, and um, and on the state, um, it's it's ordinary income because there's no long-term capital gain treatment in Maine, at least for for timber. So I'm so that's another consideration here about um, you know, selling, your, selling your carbon credits. Uh, so this is uh, uh, a, 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 a program that NCX, and they started, this is a, a basically a satellite-based system. There's no minimum acreage. You're making a one-year commitment. Now it sounds, Great, right? I mean, one year, that's perfect. You're basically saying, they're saying, and um, you're, you're deferring to harvest. You're basically saying, you're gonna keep for the next year, all the carbon that you have currently, plus 
growth and they figure out how much that is through satellites. And they're saying, if at the end of a year, you have as much as you started with, plus our growth calculation, we will pay you a certain amount of money. So there's no upfront cost. You send them a map of your property. They look at it. They do an assessment. They have a uh, confidential algorithms they use. How like it is you would harvest? Is a, is, are you in an area where there are markets? Uh, all kinds of factors they, they, they figure out. And they determine how many carbon credits you have based upon their own internal process. Then they turn around and say, uh, well, uh, what, how much do you want to sell them for? You, say you have 100 credits. They'll say, you got 100 credits. You can tell them how much you want to sell them for. Um, because they're gonna uh, they're gonna bid those out to companies that want to buy carbon credits. Generally, the cost is the value that you would get is about five to ten acres a year. So for one year, you'd be paid somewhere between five and ten dollars per acre per year. Uh, that's what it comes out. So if you got a hundred if you got a hundred acres, um, and your your carbon is accepted into the program, you're gonna five, put somewhere between you know, five hundred and a thousand dollars is what you would be um, receiving at the end of, of the year, with no expenses up front, other than your time to send a management plan. Now they do; they will go out on the ground and, on select properties and actually do an assessment, um, but that's not a cost that incurred by the landowner. Um, so this program is not yet reg recognized by those registries that I mentioned earlier, those two registries or any of the other registries. In fact, this program was turned down by one of those registries. Um, it has, but it is still exists. It has cut back as it tries to figure out the best way to go forward. Um, I can tell you that um, our, our organization uh, you have to put all of your land in. You can't say you have you have to all of your land, all of your forested land. You have to put it in. You can't say I'm going to put some in and not the others because you'll just harvest them. It's all in or not. But we have one property that's a 50-50 ownership um, with with another individual. So we were able to separate that out from our our. We have a land trust with about 8,000 acres, but we took this one property where 50% ownership and just to test this system out. And we enrolled it in this program last uh, last spring, um, and they actually did go out on the ground and did an evaluation. Um, they gave us uh, an estimate of the carbon uh, credits that we offered to sell them. We um, we said we would sell them at eight. They actually got us ten. A minimum we sell for eight dollars uh, a unit. Uh, we we asked they actually sold them for ten to a company. Um, and we're waiting to see now that at the end of the one year, they're going to go back and do this evaluation and see if we have as much carbon as we, th we thought. We do, they send a check. If not, they don't. Um, and in fact, uh, you if there's a natural disaster, there's some leeway, you get less payment. But if if it more than 25% of it disappears, or blow, I mean, blows down or dies or something, you don't receive anything. But you haven't got any money invested in it. One of the downsides of this one is, uh, again, it's not recognized by the registry, so there are companies willing to buy the credits, but it's not in this carbon exchange um, yet. And then, so they're selling directly to a company. And then um, there, these systems are competing with each other. And one of the conditions that some of the other programs that are being developed are saying, well, if you enroll in one program and you're and you you'll never be able to enroll in ours if your time lapses on the other program meaning that there are there are programs saying well if you enroll in a program like this for a year or less you know you can never at the end of the year you you don't you can't go over and register go into our 40-year program um so that's one of the things going on and there's partly competition here going on between frankly these different approaches so this one has real possibilities. It's the simplest one. 
Whether it survives or not, it's not clear. I can tell you that um, they just laid off 40% of their employees last two weeks ago. Um, so they've got to recalculate how they're operating, but it is a company that uh, has had back backing from some major, major uh, companies It's a um, who see the utility of using satellite imagery and things like that to deal with this issue. And this is a company that's kind of made its, that was essentially a remote sensing satellite assessment company, NCX. So I think there's possibilities here, but they haven't got it all figured out yet. But it is, it is available. I don't know right now if they're taking additional people into the program or not. I was talking to somebody that, that um, had applied and they said, well, uh, you're on our list, but we've got, we've got more than, we've got more than we can sell right now. Um, so this is a possibility. Um, but we'll be talking about more when, at the end of our year, when we're talking about it, um, uh, about our experience with, with this program, we'll, um, we'll talk more about it. If you're a member, you'll, you're reading about it in our newsletter. We're still doing it all good without questions, Jen. No questions yet. I hope I hope there are people listening. Yeah, I think. <laughs> so the second one, and again, the NCX folks are coming to our annual meeting, as is the Family Forest Carbon Program. This is a very different approach. This is a joint project between the American Forest Foundation and the Nature Conservancy, and they have a completely different approach. Um, what they what they do is to say to landowners, um, uh, there's two things. It, they're, they're, they've been testing out this concept in a, in a few other states, in Vermont, New York, Massachusetts, I think maybe Pennsylvania. It's not available in Maine yet, but I've been told it will be here next year. Um, and this says, so remember NCX was no minimum. Uh, this is about, it looks like it's gonna be about a 30 acre minimum. You have to make a 10 to 20 year commitment. The NCX was a one year. The traditional voluntary is 40 years. So this is in between. And you receive payments for certain things that you do. Um, it's not this permanent plot inventory work, things like that. It's uh, either a harvest deferral, meaning you you decide you're not going to cut trees for the next 10 years or 20 years, other than maybe some firewood or something, you know, personal for personal use, but you're not going to have a commercial harvest. You're basically paid to not to sequester, to continue to sequester carbon and store it. Um, or the, uh, some practice that is actually going to increase the growth on your forest that you were not planning to do. And you 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 are, and you in, implement those, and you receive payment for doing that and maintaining those for the ten or twenty year commitment. So uh, generally, I, I think I said that the NCX was five. General, you know, the NCX approach would be like five to ten dollars per acre per year. Uh, this would end up uh, five to ten dollars per acre. Uh, this is a 10 to 15, likely to be somewhere between 10 and $15. So it's come, it's somewhat in between the uh, NCX and the more traditional. This one does have approval now on one of the registries. So, uh, and what happens here is they calculate how much carbon benefit there is from, so they, co they come to a whole bunch of different landowners who agree to either defer harvest or increase the harvest of the growth. They calculate how much carbon credit that counts. They package it all up and then they sell that onto the red. No, you don't, your credits don't get sold. You get bunched together and they, and the people that run the program sell the carbon credits. They receive the money from the company and you get paid for, to do these practices. So it's a little different approach. You're not receiving the money from the sale of the carbon. You're receiving some money to do certain things and, and then the people that have the program will, will, will then turn around and sell it at whatever cost price they can get into the marketplace. So those are two different, very different approaches. 
Um, they're all aimed at, they're both aimed at the smaller ownership. Um, they, again, require a little bit different, they have a little bit different approaches, but neither of these last two that I've talked to have you putting money up front. Um, I think they're gonna require a management plan if you, uh, if you do something to increase growth, but, that, but the money may be available to pay for a cost of a management plan to actually implement increasing growth rates. So, but the idea is these are not major uh, upfront costs for landowners and trying to get that time commitment down from, from started at 100 to 40 down to something you know, much less than 40, because even 40 isn't something that most landowners are willing to do. So I want to talk about some cautions uh, about markets. Um, they can be really complicated, and you need to understand them before you sign yourself up, because that, once you sign in, you're, you're in, you know, it runs with your land. If you've sold your carbon credits and you transfer your property, those carbon those responsibilities go go with your property. So it's not like you can sell it to somebody and say, "Well, I'm, you know, you don't have to. You're not bound by that credit. You're not bound by what what I what I did. You're basically sold that carbon to somebody. They don't. You, you know, they they have bought it. Um, so the next owner can still generate some revenue and harvest, but they have to maintain that same level of carbon, for example, that you had. So that's a challenge. And it, so it's not for everyone to do it. If you think the land's gonna turn over a lot, it's probably not the right thing to do. Um, the technology will change everything here. I, I am convinced that the solution to this is gonna be remote sensing satellites and perfecting that approach because the idea that, um, you know, you're going to send foresters out on the ground. It's very expensive to, to to maintain these inventory systems, and that's a major impediment. And I think you're talking we're talking about satellite type approaches, or the second option there of paid for practices. Um, there are major changes ahead. Um, everybody's trying a number of different systems are being developed to try to deal with this very issue. Uh, for smaller ownerships. And so, and even the carbon registries are changing their standards. They, ha they have new standards that come out every couple of years that any new project must meet. So those are changing. I think it's premature for an awful lot of folks to jump in, to be honest with you. But my, my personal sense, and this is not based upon any vast inside information, but I think the carbon credits are going to be the most valuable from between now and the next 30 years. And then after that, it seems to me we're going to be dealing with reduction in emissions and other offset things and forests will not be where the action is. That's my personal sense. But um, those that have gotten in early have done very well on some of the carbon sales that landowners have. Some of the uh, folks that have done that have done very well. Tom, um, we do have a couple of questions. Sure. All right. Um, one is, is the family program, uh, the one you just presented, yeah. um, an annual payment or a one-time payment? Um, that is about what you will generate um, uh, from being in the, that's about what you will receive uh, over that 10 to 20 year period of time. So it is not an annual payment. It is the amount that the gross amount you will receive. And then there's as, another, as yes, go ahead. No, there's another question. So when when you're done, yeah, with that, go ahead. Um, if a, a woodlot has a, uh, a USDA NRCS conservation easement, can it also be in the carbon market? Um, so the carbon market, if you can never, if you cannot cut trees, you probably are going to have a very difficult, remember if, if I, I don't know what the, I don't know what the conservation easement, I, I'm not sure if they're talking about a mansion plan to follow the NRCS or are you talking about an actual conservation easement. But if, if the land is restricted from harvesting trees, it's probably never going to qualify for a carbon project. 
because the idea is what is it you're getting, what is it you're paid for? You can't do anything anyway. So you, you're being compensated for not doing things or doing certain things. But if you if if you've got if somebody has a conservation easement with no, you know, land with no cutting of trees or very, very, very limited cutting of trees, probably never going to qualify for a carbon market because you're already, you're already, you've essentially almost sold your car, given up your carbon credits without being paid for it in a, in a forever wild situation. I don't know if that answers the question. If it's, if it doesn't, whoever asked that should come right back and, and ask. Well, yeah, it was Elliot. Did you want to? Uh, Elliot, is that you, Elliot? Yeah, sure. Follow up with that. Oh, go ahead, Elliot. No, it's it's just something like considering on a on a two hundred acre piece of land at this point in time because of its significance um, ecologically, yeah. literally abuts the uh, Sunkays Meadows Wildlife Refuge. Yeah. Um, but it is a very restrictive conservation easement. Um, and and your your comment about uh, no cutting of trees or very limited. I mean, you have to apply to be able to do something like that. Um, that helps answer the question for me. Okay. Okay. Appreciate it. I, yeah, that's, I think that's likely what's, you know, um, remember you might technically qualify for something, but it probably is not going to be a, vi you know, in those situations, probably not a viable project. Yeah. Uh, that would be my guess, but. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Properties that are very highly restricted are not likely to be in be able to be players in the carbon markets. No. Yeah. Um, as I say at the on my slide, I think offsets are going to be probably the most important over the next 20 years. Um, and then I expect technology is going to, you know, the, the long-term goal is, is to reduce emissions, find ways to reduce emissions so that you don't have to offset as much. Um, you know, if you look at what are the goals the governor laid out, the the reduction in emissions and the carbon sequestration. If we meet, if we meet the reductions in emissions, we will qualify. We will be carbon neutral, frankly. So if you can push the emissions down enough, but you remember that getting to zero is not possible either. I mean, they still have to have activities that generate. We're still going to have to, you know have a, an economy that, that end up, ends up emitting something. I um, mean, that's just the reality of it. So you're not gonna get to zero, but if you can be more efficient about it, then um, I think we will be, it's a good bet we can be carbon neutral if you can keep the forest base pretty close to where it is. We asked, you know, we, I worked on the carbon task force for um, woodland owners and um, we finally came up with, you know, what would be a goal? And the goal would be to keep the amount of carbon sequestered um, at its current level. And that sounds like a minimalistic goal, but when you start talking about converting land to some other use, you're going to lose, converting, converting forest land to some non-forest use, you lose that, that base. So you, the idea is we should continue to do just what we're doing, you know, at least what we're doing and offset any losses in forest acreage with additional activities that that take up that slack. And it's still a huge, huge component of uh, dealing with this issue of climate and it presents a lot of opportunities, frankly, for landowners. Um, so these are some of the, I, I want to talk about the challenges from a landowner's point of view because uh, and dealing in the carbon markets and the things to think about um, with changes in, with climate change, where we are, you know, to me, the biggest threat to the forest of Maine are insect and diseases, and not uh, both both native, but particularly those that have been brought in from some other place. Um, you know, a good example now, brown tail moth is may or may not be a it probably not a huge, huge. It's a real. It's a. It's a major inconvenience and a health issue, but it shows you what happens when you have a climate situation that changes, and suddenly we've never had an outbreak like this, and all of a sudden there's an outbreak, and uh, if that's an introduced pest, and it can see, you can see what can happen as an example of an insect that that's here doesn't have the as doesn't have the built up natural predators, although the, the diseases are starting to kick in on that. But insects and diseases. So 
so as the climate changes, the challenges of insect diseases go up for Orlando. Um, drought, we had a dr wicked drought this year uh, during the summer. Now look at it. Um, now we're, we've got water levels up. Uh, so drought, you know, the, it's, not the, it's not the annual amount of rain. It's when the rain occurs or doesn't occur, it affects the forest more than anything. If it's really, really dry in the growing season, you remember that um, softwood trees shut down in the late summer and hardwood trees are, are later. So it's that summer, particularly during that, that uh, mid to uh, late summer, if you have really, really dry conditions, you will affect the growth on trees more. You know, we said, gee, we, we're probably up to almost average rainfall for the year, but when does it come? And um, that's an important consideration. And projections are that climate is going, climate changes are going to affect that dynamic, um, and as well as more storms and more storms and rain events. And how does that affect the forest? Um, harvest timing. You know, um, it used to be you could. You know, we used to harvest in Maine about, about seventy percent of the volume of the harvesting was done in the winter time on frozen ground. It's a crapshoot now of whether you're going to even have uh, adequate frozen ground to uh, in Maine. You know, it's uh, you used to be able to about this time of year you'd see pretty good freeze up. Ground isn't frozen where I am, and probably not where you are. And so, how do you you time the harvest? And again, you don't want to you want, you want to ideally we do it on as much as we can on frozen ground. You got less disturbance, but can, are we going to be able to do that? I, I, I don't know. Um, fire is often thought of as the, this big risk. It is a huge risk in parts of this country, for sure. In Maine, you do not see substantial losses from fire. Um, you know, the, we have, I don't know how many, we have several hundred fires, but most of them are very, very small. Uh, we haven't had made, you know, once in a while have a significant fire and we need to plan for that. But the losses from fire do not come anywhere near what the losses in uh, insect diseases are. And again, the, the tree dies or, or you know, if it's affected by insect diseases, it either doesn't grow as, as fast as or it's not sequestering as much carbon or it dies and, uh, and uh, the carbon is released. And then one of the challenges is uh, regulations. The issue, it was interesting, I served on that task force and I, I still remember the, the University of Maine produced the the data that showed the forest is offsetting 75% of the emissions in the state. And the first question asked by somebody, well, how much more can you guys do? And I thought that was an interesting question because instead of saying, oh my gosh, it's incredible that you got 75%, the idea is, well, let's not look at emissions. Let's not, let's not look at who's causing kind of the increase to uh, causing the emissions. Let's see if we can sequester more, which I think is the wrong approach. It, it, it is, uh, the concern is, will landowners be asked, you know, well, if you've done 75%, if, like I said at the beginning, let's just not cut trees and we could get to a much better, some people think much even better numbers. Um, so, you know, there are people talking about, well, let's just put regulations on landowners that force them to store more carbon and then We'll even have a better situation. And my argument back is the landowners are not the ones causing the problem. They shouldn't be the ones to have to pay the extra expense. It should, if you look at the sources of, of uh, emissions that I started with, it's in the transportation and, and, uh, and housing. That's where the action is. And that's where a lot of the work has got to, got to occur. Tom, I'm going to so, let I'm going to let Denny, I'm going to interrupt you. Um, Denny, Denny, yeah. Yeah, would you uh, ask your question, Denny? Good. Go ahead, um, Denny. Denny, pop up your screen if you right. want. Um, good, how are you, Denny? I'm doing great. <clears throat> that was a wicked drought there in August. I was getting discouraged. Uh, yeah. the, tree, the trees were starting to scream around my house. I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, great presentation. Uh, <clears throat> I'm wondering... Is there an average annual rate of CO2 sequestration for Maine woodlands that makes any sense? Um, I think there is. I don't know the number, but uh, there is a number that's used, and I'll, I'll, I'll 
I'll get it. There is a estimate that's used. Um, and I will, I always get confused. We start, you know, the people start talking metric units of this and that, and I get confused, but um, I will, I will, uh, I will find out the actual number that's being used. I, and, I know uh, there's a big, big variance between the Northwoods and, 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 and Southern Maine with it's hard. Right, with, right. that's been, right. So, yeah. I mean, there's a number, but there, yeah, you can, I believe there's some data, some information on, you know, average hardwood stocking forest land would have this and average softwood stocking would have this, you know, as an estimate, again, uh, just a, a, a round number. Yeah. Just as one data point uh, for a project canopy grant here in Cumberland where, where we have a thousand acres of forest land in our town, yeah. Yeah. the forester came up uh, with uh, three to four ton uh, metric tons of CO2. Yeah. Emissions yeah. Yeah. per acre per year. Um, yeah. It's pretty high, uh, but again, yeah. it's because of the stocking and a lot of oak and whatnot. So, uh, and I own, and Denny, Denny is a landowner that actually had a carbon inventory done, right, Denny, uh, early yeah. on? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That wasn't the expensive part. The expensive part was getting the certification. So, I, I yeah. Yeah. That. yeah. yeah. Um, just so you know, we are, uh, you know, our, and uh, our organization, we have an inventory system. We put it in place. Uh, we know how much carbon we have, uh, and it is substantial. And I mean, our average stocking. Now, I I'm a, I think of cords. So, but uh, we're over, we're over thirty cords of the acre average stocking on our land. So we have substantial carbon resources on the eight thousand acres that we own. And the interesting thing about us, if we want to do a carbon project, is our land is all over the state. So we already have incredibly diverse landscape. So the risk for, you know, the idea that all of our, one of the challenges as a landowner, if you're in a program and you have a disaster, you know, a hurricane goes through and blows down all your timber, you've got a, you've got a problem. Our lands, we have 70 parcels of land in 15 counties. The chances of it all being wiped out in every forest type you can imagine, is not very high. So we've, we've got, Kind of an ideal situation, I guess, as far as diversity is concerned. So, but good to talk to you, to Denny. And Denny's been a big. Denny has been a big, uh, at, big proponent on the carbon side and the climate side. So, and and we there's an article um, on our carbon uh, pay, web page uh, that we did about Denny's project on his property. So, I might yep. send everybody a link to that. Yep. So kind of, uh, any other questions, Jen? Yeah, there's another one. What happens with the tree growth tax law? Very good question. Yep. Um, I, I have concerns right now about, and I've expressed this to a number of people, I have concerns that particularly a deferral program that says you can't, you know, you're, you're not going to cut trees for the next 20, 10 to 20 years. Now, in tree growth, you, it may be legitimate not to cut. I mean, if you don't, if, I mean, there, it some, sometimes it is not, it doesn't make sense to cut or the, the volume isn't there. But if you're starting to defer a harvest for a substantial amount of time, do you call, you know, is there an argument that you would, should not be in the tree growth tax law program? Even though you could manage the timber, you could do some harvesting. I believe we need to solve that problem, and and, and uh, frankly, and and um, personally, I think carbon is a forest product, but um, that's not going to be universally held. And there is a concern, and I understand the legitimacy of the concern of wood using industries are concerned that carbon markets will reduce the supply of wood to the point where either the cost is too high. For them to operate, or that you know, the, just the availability would is impacted. So, my challenge, the challenge I think is the Trigo Tax Law program is implemented town by town, and um, you could have a town say, "Well, we don't think you should qualify for it if you're in a carbon program," and try to remove you. And it isn't clear what would happen. I prefer that landowners be protected up front, and and uh, and I expect. We will be putting legislation in this year to address that issue in the legislature. How's that? 
So um, it's to be to be continued. <laughs> to be continued, but it is a legitimate concern. Yeah. I, I think it's a high risk for somebody to enter a carbon defer up deferral program for a substantial amount of time and be in the Trigo tax law program at this point. Um, so the, if you think about the bigger picture of carbon, you know, whether whether you ever sell carbon or not, or or you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of people who say these carbon markets are hocus pocus and you know, I'm I'm sure they're not perfect. But when you think about it keeps land, it's a way to keep land forested. It also provides revenue for to cover taxes and takes the pressure off, um, um, you know, the takes pressure off the conversion of the land. And it's carbon markets are compatible with sound forest management. It's not like there aren't many projects that are forever wild. I mean, that where the where you basically give up you know, 40 years rights to ever cut trees. Um, and, you know, for years, there's been discussion about all the other benefits that keep go that the landowners provide to society with um, keeping land as forested land, whether it's water quality or wildlife habitat or all these other values. And frankly, we finally, finally found us, you know, they, they talk about ecosystem services and landowners ought to be paid for that. Well, nobody's ever figured out how to do that. But carbon markets are essentially a way of doing that to say, not only are you dealing with the carbon pump, but you're also providing and maintaining all these other public benefits that come from the forest. So I, I, this is a really kind of interesting area, I think for most, for to be developed, it needs to make sense, but you know, we wanna make these things absolutely perfect. And I don't know that they will be, but it is a way to keep this land, keep it as forested and, um, and taking the pressure off it and all the other values that come from the forest. So I'm pretty excited about it. I think there are real opportunities here and that's why we're so engaged in this. So um, with that, I'm happy to take individual any more. I think, is that my last slide? I think it is. Yeah. So I'm happy to take other questions or uh, so you can unmute and ask a question if you want, or raise your hand, or or just a wave or something. And um, we'll, if you remember, you're going to read much more about it this on an ongoing basis because we're involved. I would encourage you to come to. You can either come to our annual meeting, or we're doing a hybrid, so you can watch it online. Um, but there'll be this discussion in the afternoon session from those two the two programs that I mentioned. And they'll probably have additional information that, you know, about their approaches that, you know, that are new to me and new, new to everybody. Don, this is Denny again. Here's another question. Uh, yeah. Weyerhaeuser seems to have really gotten engaged in this in a big way. They set up a, a separate business line on this, uh, selling forest offsets off, off their own properties. Yeah. And they mentioned yeah. doing a major deal in Maine. Do you, do you know anything about that? carbon deal on their own properties? I don't. I, I know that every single substantial landowner has looked at this issue. Uh, I, you know, um, they know, you know, they, they're trying to figure it out and what makes sense. Um, you know, obviously it affects the, it, it affects the resale of your property. You know, if you sold the, if you're a, a small land or a large one, and you've sold your carbon credits, particularly if you're in the woodland business, you're now restricted by what you're going to be able to produce from those lands on the, over a period of time. And I'm sure they're all looking at it, but I don't know. I don't know if any of them are announced, got ready to announce the, you know, Baskahegan um, down in Washington County, Hancock County, they have done several projects. Uh, and they, they've actually, I believe, a lot, taken some of the money they had and actually bought more land. So. Um, I have a question. Sure. So I know I've asked you this before, but it keeps, uh, it's like a nightmare to me anyway. Uh, Groundhog Day. Are you aware of anybody that's purchased carbon credits has been been labeled the person who owned the land as a bad actor, basically. It's the bad actors. So somebody buys your credits and then 
becomes a problem for the landowner as to who the purchaser yeah. of the credits is. Is that has that happened to anybody? Well, if you think about the permit, if you think about the regulatory market, every one of those people is a polluter. I mean, the people that are required by law, yeah. they are they are polluting, right? So that they by law are would be called potentially a bad actor, I guess. Um, you know, all major companies, frankly, are looking at this. You could have an airline. Is an airline a bad actor? I don't know. It's, it's a, you know, it depends on your perspective. Is Microsoft a bad actor? For some people it is, some people it's not. Poland Spring, is, a bad, is that a bad actor or not? Um, the difference, I, I think what is likely, you know, sometimes, um, depending on how you do these deals, you may or may not know who buys your carbon credits. Um, and uh, some people may not want to know, but somebody's buying them so that they can offset, even if in the voluntary market, they're doing it to offset their emissions. So they are a polluter, but every one of us is doing something to pollute. Um, so I don't know, Richard, I mean, I haven't heard, uh, uh, at least the, the projects that have been done in Maine, I haven't heard any backlash about basically, you know, X company bought your carbon credits and you should never have done that. That just allows them to pollute. But there is that point of view. Thank you. You can, you can in some cases, because um, we've been talking to different programs, you can in some cases, uh, remember they make more money when, if you make a, if you make a deal with a, carbon, a company that registers their carbon credits, you, um, they make a, they're getting a percentage. So they want to sell for the highest price that they can. So they don't really like the idea that you say, I don't want you to sell to a gas company, an oil company, or a coal company, because they probably will pay the most, uh, to be honest with you, even if they're not required, even if it's in the voluntary market. Um, but you can have, you can stipulate certain things that say, I, you know, you have some leeway on what, you where your carbon credits can go. You're not, landowner is not a big enough player to basically say, I want my credits only go to, I don't know, pick some something that is not, you know, that is very non-controversial or something, a university or something maybe. Um, I want all my credits to go to educational institutions. Um, that's probably not gonna happen. Well, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, yep. One is um, from uh, Ross Pryor. Do you want to jump in, Ross? Ask your question. Is Ross the one from Wisconsin? Yes. Yes, Ross, I think we met. <laughs> jump in if you'd like, or I can just read the question. There you go. Do you want to ask, ask your question, Ross? All right. Um, does greatly extending the rotations uh, on for, for timber uh, increase the carbon storage in the forest, or do you get more mortality that balances out? I think I think, I think what you increasing do, the rotation yep. of the yep. forest increase the amount of storage. I I think I think it it absolutely can. Um, well, ideal in a ideal situation like that, you'd be you'd be growing the trees longer, but you'd be um, doing some thinning to try to capture some mortality, so you could actually grow a larger, longer rotation, but but do some thinnings and take out the mortality. And I think you could, I think you'd have a double benefit there. I mean, that's the strategy. Frankly, one of the strategies we've been using on some of our lands, anyway. You know, grow large trees, um, but create growing space so that we can put the money, the money, the wood onto the trees that have the best value and the best potential. And you know, that's that's a strategy a lot of landowners use. So that just means maybe holding them a little bit longer, but you're going to sequester. You're going to you could sequester more, store more. Uh, you may not be able to sequester it as much on a rate, but you'll store it a, a whole lot. Another question, Jen? Yeah, um, Elliot's got another question. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to let yeah, you yeah. Go ahead, Elliot. 
I'm almost unmuted. There we go. Right, I'm going to read this straight from my notes and see if you know anything about it. Okay. Uh, the date is September 16th, 2022, about not quite three months ago. The USDA announced a carbon credit program for New England called the New England Climate Smart Forest Partnership. Using good management techniques and improved forests, meaning allowed to grow longer, will store more carbon. The goal is for 100,000 acres in Maine. Thinning is an allowable activity. The program was just announced, so it'll be a while before someone can apply. But I didn't know whether you'd heard anything about it or anybody. Yeah, knew. it's it's part of the it's part of the whatever they call it. I don't. Uh, I can't remember. You know, whatever the when Congress passed the big uh, budget issue. So it maybe it, it may be some of the regulations coming down belatedly after two or three years, but. Yeah, I think, you know, a big player is the New England Forestry Foundation on that. And that's all, I think that's all, I think it's going to be all, you know, covering all of New England. I don't know if the dollar amount matches is all New England or just Maine, but there'll be some, my guess is what you'll see out of that is, is uh, practices that kind of the approach, like um, it'll be practice-based, I think, you know, where like an NRCS project that says yeah. basically we're going to yeah. pay people to do certain it, it's kind of like a i think it's going to be i like that they operate like a cost share program okay i think but it's there are no rules yet yeah okay that's what i was asking i didn't know whether you'd heard anything about it or yeah yeah there's not much detail to it though yeah yeah, yeah. who else has got a question any others jen not yet jump in if you have one Well, I'm happy, anytime, uh, I would just say, if you have any questions, you can certainly drop me an email or drop Jen an email or give us a call. Happy to talk to anybody about, about it. I would say keep, keep watch of this because there are, there are opportunities, um, but you got to figure out, it's kind of like all, you know, just make sure you understand what you're, if you're signing up for something for a long period of time, make sure you know what you're doing. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, understand what the all what the responsibilities are, because it's probably going to be, it's going to carry off, it's going to carry, for many landlords, it's going to be, it's going to impact the next owner. And the next generation. So this is part of legacy planning as well, which I like. I do think, I do think that the, the, the assumption on carbon was that you can't, man, you know, there's, there's a, one of the early rumors was you couldn't ever manage the forest, and that's not the case. I mean, I remember that carbon. Um, the the event, the one thing about carbon is, you know, if you, if you have a, it doesn't the quality of a tree doesn't make any difference in the carbon markets. You can have a wolf pine tree and a pine tree straight as an arrow. And it has, if they have the same amount of carbon, they're worth the same amount in the carbon markets. So when you have low grade uh, trees, there's hope for you as a landowner, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, because you're looking at it and saying, oh, I got a bunch of ugly trees here, but you have potential there, you know, because those trees, those trees have other values now that are monetized. And so for those that have, had, uh, that own mistreated, you know, not by necessarily by them, but have inherited or acquired mistreated property. There's potential resources there to help you restore it. To be honest with you, mm. so. Uh, but remember, the carbon is, and and typical inventories, forest inventories have not counted non-commercial trees, trees that are that are of poor quality and things like that. And carbon takes all those into account. I mean, if it's got carbon, it's it counts. Uh, if it's a lot, if it's tree with carbon in it, so there's actually more carbon than uh, in the forest than people think because we're typically thinking forest inventories basically take out anything that isn't commercial, and that's not the case in the carbon carbon inventories. I posted a few links. Um, one is the link to our annual meeting webpage, um, which has our agenda. So you can see what programs we're gonna be offering that day and what the last program will be uh, about uh, the, from the NCX folks, as well as the forest, uh, 
the Family Forest Carbon Program. So you can hear more, in more detail about what they offer and how woodland owners can uh, get involved. And then also we have a climate change carbon web page as well. And the link's there in the chat. Um, that's where Denny's article, where we did a feature on Denny's uh, work on his property is there and other articles that we've done about uh, carbon and climate change. So check that out. And then Elliot, you have another question. So go ahead. Yeah, just just a, a quick thing on timing. When you were talking about NCX, you made a little bit of a comment that they may not be taking anybody at the moment. But let's say you wanted to go into the family uh, yep. family forest first. Yep. My yep. Right, Karen. Yep. What are we looking at? Are we looking at uh, months, years getting into that? No, I don't think so. I again, uh, it's not available in Maine right now. But I think what we'll find out in January is as there. Uh, but they've been enrolling people in those states where they're working, and you know that doesn't take forever to 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 get into those. And, I, and the fact that they get recognized by the registry means they're. I think they're going to move forward. And the last conversation I had with these folks is that you we you should expect to see that program available in Maine. But we'll we'll have a better chance to query them at um, at the annual meeting. I'm sure they'll talk about when it's going to be available in Maine. Okay. All right. Yep. Thank you. I know you're a good member, so you'll be you'll be tuned right into that. <laughs> <anyway>. <laughs> oh, and that reminds me, if you're not a member, please consider becoming a member of Maine Woodland <laughs> Owners. You do get a monthly newsletter, 20 pages. These types of topics get discussed every month. Yep. Or, yes. Elliot would be glad to tell you all the benefits <laughs> of that, so I'm sure. Yeah, I didn't do that pitch in the beginning, but I have a feeling a lot of you are already members and we thank you for your support. Um, any other last minute questions? We're, we're just out of time, but we really are happy to... Uh, it did go an hour and a half. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. I started this and I said, well, we'll be done in 45 minutes. No, no. Good. Well, it's great to have everyone. Uh, and Tom's uh, email address is also listed on the chat. So um, feel free to reach out if you come up with other questions after this event. And we'll probably do something like this in the new year. I would say in 2023, we'll certainly have a, a handful yep. of carbon, well. carbon programs. We'll have other, uh, in the winter is when we do a lot of our um, webinars as well. We're probably going to do one on the uh, true growth tax, tax law program. Uh, we'll do a uh, forestry 101. We'll have a, a whole bunch. We'll do silviculture one, uh, uh, silviculture focused program with Bob Seymour. So just check our website, our events page as well. We love connecting with everybody as much as we can. I hope you have a great holiday. Thank you all for your attention. So. Yeah, and we'll see you in yep. January at our annual meeting, hopefully. See All right. you. See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.